safe and healthy and happy and, and living sustainably into the next century or more, engineers must be able to work collaboratively across professions, uh, including business, medicine, and, and dare I say it, law. Um, uh, but we even go further to say that engineers need to be able to rise to, posi to positions of influence in both the public and the uh, private uh, sectors. And thus to maximize our learning during these discussions and during this lecture series, we strove to assemble a very diverse set of distinguished speakers uh, who can capture all of these perspectives uh, of, of these issues that uh, we've been discussing. So today we are very privileged to have with us someone who is well steeped in the issues of the day in both the, uh, the private and the, on the public sector. Uh, public, uh, sector. Uh, Mr. Simon Warren is uh, Vice Chairman and Chief Legal Officer for Millennium Management, LLC, which is a hedge fund firm managing over $14 billion in assets. He also serves on the Board of Directors of Teledyne Technologies and Electronic Systems, Instrumentation, Imaging, and Communications Corporation, with annual sales approaching $2 billion through nearly 100 different Teledyne companies. He also directs the Stanford Law School's Directors College, uh, which is the U.S. premier program for independent directors of publicly held companies. And in his spare time, when he has, uh, he teaches at the NY Law, NYU Law and Business Schools. And prior to his current uh, full-time job, he served as general counsel for the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, and he was educated at Occidental College in uh, L.A. and the Michigan Law School. Help me welcome Mr. Simon Warren. Thank you very much, Dean, and, and uh, good afternoon to, to all of you. Uh, I, I'm uh, really quite pleased to be here speaking at a College of Engineering. I've got a, a, a lifelong association, one way or another, with engineers. My father was an engineer, a uh, chemical engineer, and, and always thought of things the way engineers do, and taught me the way engineers think about many things, which is sometimes good. Uh, <laughs> most of the time, probably, but uh, not, always, not always perfect, but I'll, I'll talk about all of that as we, as we go on. I do want to thank my friends Bob and Diane Malone and the Halliburton Foundation for putting together, for sponsoring this series of talks. And, and I must compliment the dean and, and the university as well. It strikes me as unusual for a college of engineering to bring together a diverse group of people to talk about what colleges of engineering should be thinking about going forward. I'm not sure Is that better now? I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure there's a law school in the country that would sit down and say we ought to think about the future of legal education Let's get an engineer, let's get a doctor, let's get a psychologist in to talk to us about what we ought to be doing. And, and you know, as I thought about this talk and I, I thought about uh, uh, that invitation from the dean and from the, the College of Engineering, it seemed to me that that, that expressed a view of diversity uh, that is very useful and is one of the aspects in which a diversity of thought and perception is important. I may talk about that a little bit later, I may not. It is very hard to, to disagree with the notion expressed by Alan Greenspan that, that we are transitioning from exploitation of physical resources to exploitation of concepts and ideas. That doesn't mean that exploitation of physical resources is finished by any means. And there is still a significant future in dealing with the exploitation of physical resources and doing so 
carefully, and if you don't think that's true, talk to the people about at, at BP about the uh, Gulf oil spill and the importance of carefully uh, exploiting physical resources. Uh, but, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Just one data point when, when we think about that transition. I'm told that in 1993, a little bit less than 20 years ago, 1% of the information flow in the world of information that went through two-way electronic communications, basically telephone, 1% of those communications uh, went over the internet in 1993. By 2000, seven years later, it was 51%. By 2007, it was 97% of the information flow. And that's obviously a huge change and that is simply one data point. It's continuing and it's important. And it's valuable and important to think about where engineers fit in to the new world, what the implications of that kind of change are, and how engineering schools prepare for it. Now, the dean gave you uh, much of my background and, and and part that the, the dean did not mention, no reason he should, was, was that I've been associated uh, with some number of startups one way or another, uh, many of which are technologically oriented. I was uh, privileged when, when Mark Andreessen came out of the University of Illinois probably 12 years ago, he, he brought with him the development of Mosaic, which became the first internet browser known as Netscape. And after Mark sold that company, he started another company which started out as a, a website hosting a firm, but it moved into software provisioning. And Mark asked me to be on the board of directors of that company, which was Opsware, uh, which we ultimately sold to Hewlett Packard. And then uh, Mark and his partner, Ben Horowitz, started Andreessen Horowitz Ventures, which is uh, one of the premier venture capital firms right now out there. And let me just put in a, a, a useful plug, if you will. Uh, for those of you who are thinking about entrepreneurial futures and want to think about uh, preparing for that role, I encourage you uh, to get Ben's blog, and that's what it's called, Ben's blog. And if you, if you Google Ben's blog, you'll get the blog, and it's Ben Horowitz. And, and what he tends to talk about is management of young technology-oriented ventures, and what's good and what's bad and what needs to be done. And he doesn't post all that often, but there's an education in there. It comes out probably once every two weeks. It's easy to follow. Um, one of the important things Ben talks about uh, is that conceptually, a lot of venture capitalists uh, move uh, the, the companies, the portfolio companies, as they become successful uh, to, to get a professional manager and to move away from the entrepreneur, their view has been since they started the uh, uh, firm three years ago that they didn't want to do that. Now, now one part of that is when they started the the uh, the company of which I was a director it started out being called Loud Cloud, uh, a little bit of a fanciful name, and became Opsware. When they started Loud Cloud, they got venture investing and. Mark was the chairman of the board and Ben was the CEO and they came to the first meeting after the initial significant funding and the lead venture capitalist said, well, when are you going to get a real manager? And Ben took that kind of personally, uh, especially since he had the entire team in front of him and he was the CEO and was being asked when they were going to get a real manager. And Ben vowed that he was never going to put a startup company in that position. Uh, but but uh, Ben feels very strongly that the entrepreneur ought to be 
the CEO in most instances that it's a lot easier to teach the entrepreneur to manage than to give a professional manager the kind of fire and dedication it needs for a startup company to really make it. But let, let me uh, move on though. I, I want to, uh, I said earlier on that, that there are a couple of, of uh, aspects of engineers uh, that, that I think are, are things to worry about, and, and these are not too important for, for the future leadership of engineering, but I can't resist uh, talking about them. Um, and, and one is the tendency sometimes to, to uh, incrementalize a problem, to break a problem into smaller and smaller pieces so that each one can be analyzed separately and to analyze it perfectly and completely, but then not to put the pieces back together, to lose sight of the whole. And the example I, I like to think of uh, that context is my father when he was getting older, when he was about 85, and he decided my mother had passed away, and, and he decided it was time for him to move into a retirement plan, a, a retirement home. And like a good engineer, he said, well, it's time for me to do that. I should do that. I should go about it methodically. And he interviewed several retirement homes. He was a fairly active 85-year-old. He was still riding his horse one day a week. When he wasn't riding his horse, he liked to be outside gardening. He also liked music and reading. But he broke down all the parts of his life and attached a weight to each and looked at six or seven different retirement homes into which he might move and added up the numbers and told me he was moving into a place where he would be in an apartment of the seventh floor of a concrete building. And I said, Dad, look at your life. You're not going there. And he said, OK. <laughs> and, and he moved into a place from which he could walk two blocks and ride his horse and where he could garden and he spent the next five years of his life in terrific happiness. The other example I like to think of is a day in 1974. And this is a different aspect really of the same thing and it's, it's the tendency sometimes of engineers to, to, to lose track of the bigger picture and do things because they can be done rather than because they ought to be done. And in 1970, Boeing flew the first commercial flight of the 747. And it was a wonderful engineering achievement. The 747 would be, still is, the workhorse of international travel for 42 years. Uh, it carried between 350 and 450 passengers and a passenger configuration. Uh, its payload was approximately 250 percent of the largest aircraft flying before the 747. There was only one slight problem. It was a little bit ahead of its time. And it could take 400 people from Houston to Hong Kong but it turned out there weren't really 400 people who wanted to go from Houston to Hong Kong on Thursday. And, and so it, it wasn't really full right away. And, and as I said, the first flight was in 1970. And in 1974-75, we had a recession, which made the problem even worse. And during that period, I remember distinctly sitting at a breakfast meeting. I used to eat breakfast with a group of people we all read the Wall Street Journal every day and talked about the problems and then went to work. Sitting at that breakfast table, reading two articles on one page of the Wall Street Journal. One article talked about how, I don't remember which airlines anymore, but United and American and Delta or something of that nature, uh, had all parked most of their 747s in the desert because in the middle of the recession, there just wasn't enough traffic to warrant using them. Uh, and they could put them in the desert in Arizona where they were fairly impervious to, to weather problems. Uh, and, and it wouldn't be so bad. 
same page of the Wall Street Journal, an article about how the engineers at Boeing had devised a modification of the 747 so it could carry twice as many passengers. <laughs> that modification never went into production. Not yet, 42 years later, it hasn't gone into production. I don't know how much time and money the engineers at Boeing spent being able to devise a 747 that would carry twice as many people. But obviously, it was a waste of time, and you all know your own examples of, of that sort of thing. Those are two small things to worry about. I'm not terribly worried about the future of engineering in conjunction with those. The, the more important thing to worry about, and, and this is also a question of looking at the big picture, for the last hundred years, in most areas of human endeavor, we have increasingly specialized. A hundred years ago, you wanted to go to a doctor, you went to the doctor. Now you need to decide what kind of a problem you have and whether you go to the cardiologist or the orthopedic guy or the, any one of a hundred different specialties. And, and we've done that for obvious reasons. And it's happened in medicine, it's happened in law, it's happened in engineering, it's happened everywhere. When, when this school was started a hundred years ago, there weren't nearly the variety of engineering specialties we have today. And, and obviously, we did that because as we got more and more knowledge, we learned that you, you needed to divide things up more and compartmentalize and examine. But then about 20 years ago, we started, and it's been increasing since then, realizing that you have to look at the whole picture, that it's useful to take uh, light going through a prism and divide it up into the, the different spectral colors, but sometimes you've got to look at the light as light. In medicine, it's the holistic approach to medicine. You need to take into consideration all aspects uh, of the person, of the patient. And, and so uh, we, we've come to realize that somehow we need to bring things back together. And that is obviously affecting engineering, and that's what the dean talked about in his, his quick summary. That is an extraordinarily important and difficult thing to accomplish in the current world, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Side by side with that, in business and in society, we see increasing role of technology and applied science, of engineering. It, is, it has always been an important part of business and of society, but it is increasingly important, and we need to be prepared for that. I obviously, given my background, think about the business relationship, but, but it's a somewhat bigger question than that. Now, on, on the uh, question of, of uh, uh, bringing everything back together and looking at the whole, MIT had an important paper that was presented a year ago. They called the Third Revolution, the Convergence of the Life Sciences, Physical Sciences, and Engineering. And that paper was written from a health science perspective and it referred to the, the three great revolutions they talked about uh, in the last 60 years uh, were first the molecular biology revolution, second the genomics revolution, and now what they call convergence. And, and let me read one quick paragraph from that, paragraph, from that report. We see convergence as a blueprint for innovation. Advances in information technology, technology, materials, imaging, nanotechnology, optics, and quantum physics, coupled with advances in computing, modeling, and simulation, have already transformed physical science. They are now beginning to transform life science as well. Convergence takes the technical tools 
as well as the, quote, disciplined design approach, quote, traditional to engineering and physics, and applies them to life science research. But convergence is not a one-way street. Biological models are simultaneously transforming engineering and physical science. Advances in biofuels, biomaterials, and viral self-assembly are just a few examples of this reciprocal relationship. Now, quite separately but interestingly, I came across uh, a discussion at a TED conference. Uh, conferences, what's TED? Technology, Engineering, and Design. Uh, and, and the TED groups put together fascinating uh, presentations, think tank presentations that the public is invited to. And I came across one in Athens uh, a year ago. Uh, same concept with, with somewhat different and, and simpler perspective, if you will, presented by Rory Sutherland, vice chairman of uh, Ogilvy Group, the advertising people. Uh, and, and he talked about an example of bringing together economics, technology, and psychology. And, and talked a little bit, in fact, about the sorts of things Dr. Jerry Porras talked about with you a couple of months ago. Uh, he gave a, a wonderful example, simple example, of the need to bring these things together. And he talked about an experiment in Korea in which they determined that, that putting a countdown clock next to a red light I mean, a traffic light, so that the, the cars could look at the clock and see when the green light was coming, dramatically reduced accidents. And, and their analysis, at least, was that it reduced the anxiety associated with uncertainty, and instead of people sort of getting ready to go and hitting the accelerator as soon as the light turned, people were more relaxed when the light turned, they moved slowly away, and, and they could see a car coming the other way, et cetera. But, but they found, with the countdown clock, uh, a dramatic reduction in uh, accidents. And, and that, he suggested, was the value of having uh, psychology together with engineering in simply a very simple example. Now, it turned out that the Chinese didn't fully appreciate the example. And, and they sort of copied it, but they put the countdown clock next to the green light <laughs> instead of the red. And it won't shock you to learn that when the countdown clock comes with the green light, people say, oh, I've only got a second left. And it dramatically increases the number of accidents. And I've noticed in New York City, they've got countdown clocks next to the pedestrian light that tells you how long you've got before you can't cross the street anymore. And I'm a little bit worried about what that's going to do, but I, I think maybe it won't have the same effect as, as on green lights. In any event, it's fairly obvious that being prepared to deal with convergence, with the coming together, with holistic approaches, uh, requires some considerable thought about curriculum, within engineering schools. Hold that thought, and I'm going to come back to it. I talked about the increasing importance of science and technology in business. And, and as a thought experiment, I looked at UTEP's engineering uh, offerings, and I thought about them in conjunction with what's happening in business. And I won't read you the list. You know it better than I do anyway. But if you think about just the principal areas of study available within the engineering school and you think about the dynamic growth in business today, there is a very strong correlation uh, between those two. Obviously, 
people coming out of engineering schools like UTEP are going to be playing an increasingly important role in various businesses. The question then comes, how are they going to be prepared? Some of them, certainly, will take an engineering undergraduate degree and get an MBA and be perfectly comfortable dealing in both of those worlds. They won't, by and large, be the more advanced engineers. There just isn't time. So you need to think, it seems to me, in terms of curriculum about how we prepare the engineering students to be business leaders. One approach is, is the, the Andreessen Horowitz approach I talked about. You don't worry about it too much. You can teach business management. If I really believed that, I wouldn't spend time teaching in a business school. Uh, I think it takes a little bit more than that. But there are two difficult constraints to work with. We still are getting more and more information. We still need more and more study. If you're going to be a high-level engineer, there are just a lot of things you need to know in the world of 2012 and 14 and 16. So we can't just eliminate very much of that. And the last I checked, we still had 24 hours in a day and we weren't going to change that. So we, we need to think about what we bring in. And it seems to me there are two ways, two, two kinds of courses to think about. One is base level. You just really need to spend some time studying this. And I think of something like accounting in that context. It seems to me everybody coming out of engineering school who looks to the possibility of a future that combines engineering and business needs to have an accounting class. You just need to, lead, to learn to speak the language of business, and that's financial accounting. So there, there are some base level classes, like accounting, that you probably need to take. The other area where you need, I think, to provide education is what I think of as background education. What I think of as creating a facility to know how to get more education when you need it. Not, not specific things. When, when I was an undergraduate uh, in my uh, I had a, a, a professor who, who, uh, of economics for whom I'd been a TA, and he gave a, a last class, like many professors do, for seniors, and he gave a lecture that I still remember to this day. I could just about quote it verbatim. He said, you've been in school for 17 years, and you've learned a lot of things. And some of those things you'll remember. You'll always remember water is H2O, and you'll always remember the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. That hasn't been what your education has been about for 17 years. We've been about teaching your instinct, teaching you to approach life. And he said, if there's one piece of advice I give you as you leave, Listen to your instinct. Don't ever ignore it, because if you've been paying attention for the last 17 years, that's what's been trained. That doesn't mean do what you instinctively think is right. It does mean listen to it and pay attention. And, and I think within the engineering school to prepare the engineers of the future, we need to spend some time thinking about ways to train the instinct that are useful. And, and one example I think of, because it's one of the things I teach at business school, is ethics. And in business schools throughout the country, including here at UTEP, particularly 
following the scandals of Enron and WorldCom and, and that period in 2001, every school in the country looked at its curriculum and said, we really need to give a grounding in ethics. And if I look around engineering schools, near as I can tell from what's available on the web, people do pay attention to engineering ethics, and, and that's very important. Obviously, a lot of engineering uh, classes are dealing with things that will affect human life and safety, and that's critically important, and those are ethical issues. But there aren't any business ethics classes, and, and the way we teach it at NYU, at least, our view of, of what we ought to be doing is using the isolated environment of a university classroom as an opportunity for people to go through thought experiments. And we typically assign teams of business students to deal with ethical problems. I had one great example I will never forget. And, and this was a couple of years ago before we all realized Facebook was a $100 billion company. We were talking about resume fraud and, and preparing the resume and, and maybe making it a little bit or maybe making it a lot better than, than uh, uh, it really was. And there was an example with the CEO of Radio Shack uh, who had forged a transcript and in fact he didn't have the MBA he said he had and the board found out about it. We talked, so, so we had a discussion of resume fraud in the class and, and one young lady and, and in the course, we talked about lying in resumes. OK, and, and then somebody said, well, what about lying on Facebook? And one young lady raised her hand and said, well, everybody lies on Facebook. <laughs> uh, but, but what we try to do in that class is give people real life examples and, and say, OK, think this through. How should you respond ethically to this situation? You're on the board, and you find out the CEO uh, has lied on his resume. How should you respond to that situation, et, et cetera? And our goal really is that if we can get people to think about those problems and talk them through with some experienced people around, maybe five years from then, ten years from then, when they hit ethical problems after they're out of school, they will more comfortably be able to deal with them and have a sense of the right way to go. And that's an element. That's a background element. And there are other examples that you can think of. But a background element that I think is a useful thing to, to move in to life with as you leave engineering, particularly when engineering is becoming an increasingly important part of life in business. Now, just one more point, and then I'll, I'll open it up for questions. But I think it goes a step beyond preparing people for business. I think of business because I'm involved in business. Uh, but there's another aspect, and that's the role of the engineer in society more largely. And I, I started thinking about that, and I, I did a little checking. Uh, and interestingly and disappointingly, in the history of the United States, we have had two presidents who were engineers, Herbert Hoover and Jimmy Carter, not our greatest two presidents. And, and why is that true? And, and you have to believe it's because we don't train engineers to think about the larger role in society that they can and probably should be playing. Not every one of them, of course, but some engineering graduates. And then I, I found a study that The Economist performed, and they'd gone back some 10 years and looked at, globally, 5,000 political leaders and analyzed their backgrounds, and they found nine background fields. 
law, business, diplomacy, military, journalism, economics, medicine, academia, and engineering. Among the 5,000 world leaders, they found those nine backgrounds. And the frequency with which they showed up as world leaders is the order in which I read them. And engineering was dead last. And that's something that we ought to be thinking, I think engineering schools should be thinking about for the larger society. Now, sort of the, the fact that engineering was the last was the bad news. The good news was there was only, depending on your perspective, good news, was that there was one country when engi where engineers were number one, China. Now, if China's gonna be the leader of the next century, which certainly many people talk about, that may suggest a good role for Chinese and maybe the engineer, engineering school ought to be teaching leadership on Chinese. But, but I, I think there is an important role, and as I was thinking about this talk and thinking about that question, uh, coming down here yesterday, uh, there was an article in the New York Times that, that brought it home, and, and the article, uh, there's a company out there called Light Squared, and Philip Falcone, hedge fund manager in New York, has put an enormous part of his billion dollar fortune behind Light Squared, and uh, without going into the, the whole story, Light Squared got sort of accelerated clearance to build uh, a, uh, a satellite uh, uh, network uh, to compete with existing uh, networks. Uh, and then a study came out last week uh, that showed notwithstanding the, the uh, uh, accelerated approval they'd gotten from the Federal Communications Commission to build the network, it would interfere with uh, the GPS systems, and so they weren't going to give any approval after all. Uh, and, and the question was whether Light Squared could exist, would be bankrupt, we'll see. And some people had said that this was a soluble problem. There had been a lot of political flack when Light Squared got its initial approval from the FCC. And there was one quote that came from an analyst. Quote, if this were being worked out by engineers, the nature of the debate would be very different. But engineers weren't part of the mix because it had become a political debate. And so the question is how the engineering school how the College of Engineering here at UTEP and, and others around the country, but, but I think UTEP is, is in the lead in thinking about how it transforms itself, how it prepares the students in the engineering school to be not just business leaders in the future, but society leaders in the future. And a lot of that depends on the peculiar nature of each given institution. And I'm, I'm plenty arrogant, but not arrogant enough to, to tell you that I think I have the solutions for you. Um, but I think those are the important questions to be asking. Uh, let, let me open it up to questions from any of you. Um, but I must say, I've spent the last couple of days talking to students and faculty and administration here at the university. And, and I, feel, uh, I feel quite optimistic about the future. And we all know that, that you know, pessimists see the glass as half empty and optimists see it as half full and engineers see it as twice as big as it ought to be. But <laughs> I'm optimistic when I talk to people and think about the future and see people wrestling with these questions, with this as one of many elements of diversity, in fact, that is important. Thank you.